disaster. It is a disastrous situation for Hong Kong, for Britain, for China. Is he really doing all this for us? What's he after? Do we need this? I think this initiative is well-founded, and I support it. And I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but it, how can the United States be against democracy? That's our job. If I look back over the last few months, most of the bulls are Chinese. The governor's behavior, I think, has been incompetent. Was it all worth it? Should I have settled for improving my tennis and having a quiet life and giving in gracefully? Hong Kong, 18 months on, and despite all hopes and efforts, no breakthrough with China. It's late 1993, and there appears to be no way out of the diplomatic dead end. The governor is once again close to the point of no return. The Chinese have threatened to tear up his blueprint for democracy. He wants it on the statute book. There's a symbolic moment when the senior Chinese official in Hong Kong refuses to shake hands. Do we know where my bride is? Don't talk with your mouth full, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> I can't cope with hats. Tory ladies wear hats. <laughs> now watch it, Mike. No one ever said I was a Tory lady. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my sweet. You wouldn't have said that two years ago. <laughs> Patton was now under intense pressure, not only from the Chinese, who had refused to budge an inch, but also from his critics here in Hong Kong and officials in London horrified at the prospect of a breakdown with Beijing. In public, therefore, he insisted that the British were still ready to negotiate. In private, he thought only of getting his proposals into LegCo as fast as possible. Not that he was at all certain about what would happen then, because many of the politicians here would be seriously alarmed at his failure to do a deal with China. What I've suggested here was there was no acceptable deal on DBMCs on offer. The governor decided he had to come clean and tell Hong Kong that after nine months and 18 rounds, the talks had got nowhere. He rehearsed for the questions that would follow his announcement. Is it worth it, a single seat, single vote method of a LegCo to jeopardise the talks? As there's dead time between the middle of December and the middle of January, why not wait until then and go on talking? Or until February, or until March, or until April, or May, or maybe June would be. How many rounds do we need? 34? 51? I don't think anybody else in the world would negotiate like this. We were in serious Lewis Carroll country, in which, first of all, they'd led us on about what they were saying. Secondly, uh, they were saying, we'll only explain what we actually mean if you give up a point of substance, and our explanation of what we mean will be a concession. Well, I mean, you can argue in a sense that there isn't a technical reason why you need the voting age now. No, you could do it in a month's time. Patton was privately convinced that the Chinese now had no intention of honouring the joint declaration. It's perfectly clear that what they want is to control the Legislative Council as part of their intention to control and run Hong Kong. And things may change between now and 1997. Things may change in Peking. Um, but they give every indication of simply not believing um, in uh, Hong Kong people running Hong Kong in one country, two systems. Um, you know, it's all there in the text. 
um, but the subtext and everything they do tells a very different story. Is it true the Chinese backtracked in rounds 16 and 17 after an agreement was closed in round 15? Yes, they're a bunch of wankers. <laughs> I don't... That's <laughs> 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 background briefing. I guess it's <laughs> off the rack. Government source. <laughs> outside the chamber. Deep background. <laughs> On the eve of the public announcement that talks had collapsed, Patton's opposite number, Lu Ping, had a meeting with China's most prominent ally in Hong Kong, Chang Yok Sing. They discussed the breakdown and the reasons for it. Well, Lu Ping was quite calm, actually, because I think uh, he was not surprised. He knew several days beforehand. And that, that's actually what he said. He said, I, I am very depressed. I am very uh, disappointed. But I am not surprised because, he said, uh, we never believe that Mr. Patton uh, wants to see an agreement. That, that's what he told us. Mr. Patton has always tried to sabotage the talks. Hi, I'm in rattling good form. The governor decided to go on the offensive, not just a statement to LegCo, but a media blitz as well. Its purpose, to steady Hong Kong's nerves. What we're trying to do is to salvage the talks, not to scupper the talks. Hi, how are you? Surely China will ask, what's the point of sitting around the table with this guy? Because if he doesn't get his own way, he'll just go out and do exactly what he wants to do. Hi. Hi. Do you think Britain can still achieve the honourable retreat from Hong Kong? Aye. The purpose of my statement today was to give us more time to deal with the biggest and most controversial issues. I think this is the biggest crunch so far. I think over the next three, six months, we'll be a bit uncomfortable. You've been up, you've been in the depths, you've been somewhere in between. Where are you now? Um, Down-ish. Um, but uh, I think it'll be all right. The things that are most concerning me this week are what the reactions are, are like in London when Douglas makes a statement in the House of Commons. The Foreign Secretary was due to announce that the talks were deep in trouble. Will we bequeath to Hong Kong an open and democratic system offering the electorate a genuine choice? Or will we settle for a system based on small electorates open to manipulation and corruption? The shadow foreign secretary was not helpful. The central question is what on earth has gone wrong? It seems, uh, Madam Speaker, as though the through train of democratic reform has just come off the rails. In the Lords, a former Prime Minister turned on Patton with a critique that until then he had kept to himself. The government have got themselves into a cul-de-sac, and the cul-de-sac is that they cannot now satisfy the people of Hong Kong completely, and they are now in danger, of, well, we are endangering our long-term relations with China. It is a, a, a terrible example of ineptitude. And from Patton's bitterest critic, there was yet more. It seems to me in a situation like this, the duty of people who know a little about the subject and feel that the wrong course is being followed is to speak up. There is an alternative view that we should all watch in respectful silence while the governor takes Hong Kong over the edge. I myself do not adhere to that view. Uh, I'm just aware of the capacity of... Um some of our former distinguished diplomats to make life more difficult for Hong Kong and more difficult for what we're trying to do. The central aspect of the governor's policy is entirely self-destructive. I mean, if I get more worried about those things than I do about being slagged off by the Chinese. The Chinese have made it absolutely plain that if we go ahead, as we now seem to be doing, they will dismantle the legislature in 1997 and set up their own assembly. There is no doubt in my mind that they will do that. And that is why I say that this is a dangerous and a reckless policy. And we should go for the lesser evil, namely settlement on the best terms we can get. You know, 
I dare say there are some who would uh, argue um, if China was saying, well, our price is slaughter of the firstborn, who would say, well, you know, maybe it's not unreasonable in the circumstances. You know, you have to allow for different cultural traditions. Um, you know, do we ever have a bottom line? The people of Hong Kong are gamblers, betting more per head than any other community in the world. Horse racing is a big business, where the small punters almost rub shoulders with Hong Kong's major players. With men like Sir William Purvis of the Hong Kong Bank, and one of those with whom the governor is expected to socialise despite their efforts to undermine his reforms. The chairman of a huge um, and important bank, um, very well connected uh, in Hong Kong, coming here and saying, well, the, chi the prime minister's in very considerable um, political difficulties, in a very weak position. Um, uh, I'm thinking of taking along a lot of businessmen to see him now that he's in such a difficult position and telling him he's got to change his policy on Hong Kong and China. You better understand that. And there were others. I had the chairman of one of the great oil companies um, coming here and, frankly, behaving with a sort of crudeness which um, I don't think the mafia would show. As the diplomatic crisis deepened, former colleagues turned on him as well. Men like Lord Pryor of GEC and Lord Young of Cable and Wireless, each with a huge vested interest in China. Lord Young was willing to go on the record against the governor. It is not the way, simply the way to deal, in my experience, with the Beijing leadership. In my book, you should say everything to them privately and agree what you're going to say publicly. And the simple answer is this, it's not kowtowing. To, to Beijing. It's simply the best way of getting agreement out of them. Look what's happened. Instead of having a LegCo with considerable advances that were made, he tried to expand the envelope of that LegCo by pushing it to a way that I believe was past the agreement, and he's lost all. Lord Young did used to come and see me, but never put those arguments to my face, though I used to hear what he said behind my back. Um, that happened regularly over the years. I think it is a, um, perhaps a characteristic of, of Lord Young's style, but um, I can never remember him um, coming and having a serious discussion with me about our obligations to uh, uh, the people of Hong Kong. I did not want to risk having an argument with him because I didn't want to bring in any animus in, into the relationship we have because that would react on my, my company. And so I decided, in the end, the best thing to do is, is just to keep away. With one or two exceptions, Hong Kong's homegrown tycoons whispered behind Patton's back. <laughs> the proposals that Mr. Patton had put on the table, or supposed to put on the table, is creating the venting and the airing of another voice which was not heard the previous five years. And that is the business voice. That's the business voice. Saying, watch out, because... We don't like it. That's what they're saying. What I do worry about is that some of those who advise China and some of the business leaders of the community appear to have been prepared to accept a sort of Faustian deal. I mean, I think that they, um, uh, in effect, say to Chinese leadership, look, nobody gives a button about free press or all this other stuff that the Brits went on about and stuck in the joint declaration. So long as we can go on making money, everything's all right. Look, you know, we don't try to control Hong Kong. It is not the business people's uh, desire to control Hong Kong. But they also don't want to see that they have no say in the future. At the time, no one would say so publicly. But for the future record, one tycoon was willing to give vent to what big business really wanted. To be blunt, I think he has done what he's done, and uh, 
I hope that um, you know within the next year or so, if there's a, a, a good assignment for him in London or elsewhere, uh, maybe he can move elsewhere, and hopefully we can have a new governor who can try and really understand the realities of Hong Kong and work with Beijing so that we get a better deal. One leading businessman, and one only, was willing to rally to Patton's side. Why have we got the business community thinking that Patton's got it wrong? Quite simply, uh, businessmen are interested in their money. The business community here know that China is upset with the way these negotiations are going and have assumed that the, uh, the best way to ensure their future is secure in terms of their business and so on is to go over, bend over backwards to demonstrate to China that they are pro-China and they are anti-British British on this issue. In London, as Beijing turned again on Britain, officials met to discuss the breakdown with China. The, the press reaction here this morning on the, on the Chinese uh, response today has been, are you alarmed, are you concerned, is this really the end of it? That's the sort of questions we're getting now. We've just had in the last hour or so, I think we've got a copy for you, um, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman statement oh, today, you've seen that, Lu yeah. Min. Main points, really, uh, this, this move of, of tabling the legislation is the end of the negotiations. And one thing we need to think about now is, is what, if anything, more we give Sarah for, for public use today. Yeah. International reaction? Um, just, just one point, mm -hmm. and that is that uh, the Chinese ambassador had a meeting yesterday with an all-party group. He obviously spoke in pretty stark terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No doubt this was designed to be reported back to Peking so he could demonstrate that he was mm -hmm. socking it to the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. But he was um, pretty fierce. For those officials who had been immersed in these issues for years, the Sinologists, the breakdown with Beijing was not so much a disappointment as a disaster. The ruination of their efforts to reconcile the aspirations of Hong Kong with their belief that China could never be thwarted. Their game plan had started to unfold more than a decade before Patton arrived on the scene. Under international law, the island of Hong Kong and part of Kowloon on the mainland formed a permanent British possession. But the adjoining new territories had only been leased to Britain, and the lease was to run out in 1997. As that date approached, the diplomats began to fret. No one could put a precise year to it date to it, but it was clear that if before long we hadn't got to some understanding with China about Hong Kong, then confidence would begin to uh, run, to diminish in Hong Kong. And once that began, the process of loss of confidence could be quite rapid. And the decision was eventually taken that in early 1979, an opportunity arose, a very, very rare, unique opportunity. The, the governor of Hong Kong, for the first time, since 1949, was invited to pay an official visit to, to, to China. The governor, Murray McElhose, met China's leader, Deng Xiaoping, in the Great Hall of the People. He was mightily impressed. Oh, very strong magic, no question. I've met Zhou Enlai, and that was very strong magic. But uh, Deng was different. Bright eyes, forceful speech. I suppose somehow the magic was a little hot. Maybe I made up for myself because he was he was one of the most powerful men in the world. I mean, more powerful than almost any other because of the size of the country he was governing. We barely got sat down before Deng launched off into Hong Kong and said, um, of course, Hong Kong will return to China. Sovereignty is China's. It will return. Uh, but uh, 97 is quite a while off. We could have some talks before then. But whatever happens, we will look after the special quality or characteristics of Hong Kong, just as we will with Taiwan. He lumped the two together. And he ended up by saying uh, investors in Hong Kong should set their hearts at ease. Hong Kong was worried. 
Although the colony had been ceded to Britain in perpetuity, China described the relevant treaties as invalid. The governor sought to reassure the public that though there'd been no agreement in Beijing, the colony's unique status was safe in Britain's hands. Over a period, we've moved from a situation of frigid hostility, which was abnormal and basically dangerous, into a situation of friendship and normalcy. Some critics thought the governor had sold a pass in Beijing. There is a train of criticism, which is that somehow or other we threw away a bargaining position by raising this at all. In fact, and that the Chinese might have drifted past 1997, because after all, they'd never, they'd never accepted the treaties as valid. One or two people have written in this sense. And uh, this is bunkum. I mean, the mind boggles. And that how anybody could suggest that this was the, the right and subtle way to go about it, I don't know. The question of Hong Kong did not surface again until 1982, immediately after the war in the Falklands. We had indeed achieved a great victory by restoring British sovereignty over the Falklands. Margaret Thatcher was due to go to Hong Kong within months of, of, of that great success. Uh, and yet the case we had to present to her, to ourselves, to all of us, was that Hong Kong was a place where British sovereignty was by definition going to run out. And Margaret's heart kept on cherishing the alternative and dreaming of a way in which we could have something more permanent, more durable. Heart and mind were constantly in conflict and one had to keep on restoring the sovereignty of mind over heart. Yes, I would have loved to have held Hong Kong Island for Britain. It would have been just an extra reassurance because people could see then that there would be a comparison between the way we did things and the way that mainland China did things. The Prime Minister was a problem for the diplomats. We were extremely well aware of the Prime Minister's view. After all, don't forget that this was taking place against the background of the Falklands. Uh, she was not in any mood uh, to be told things she didn't want to hear. The last thing that Margaret Thatcher wanted to be told was that she, of all people, would have to surrender the sovereignty of Hong Kong. The new territories, yes, they had to go back in 1997. But Hong Kong was different. Her advisers persisted. They told her about this street, because Boundary Street was the dividing line between territory owned by Britain on that side and territory leased from China on this side. The evidence they presented was stark. Even if the People's Liberation Army refrained from marching across what would become the border in 1997, the People's Republic of China could very easily snuff out the lights of Hong Kong with the flick of a switch. Look at the map. We had no option. Hong Kong Island is but a small percent, less than 5% of the area of the whole of Hong Kong. All the rest is China mainland. Now, there's no way in which we could say we're going to keep the sovereignty of Hong Kong. There's no way in which we could depend it. More than that, they didn't need to march in. The Chinese could just have turned off the supply of water. Thatcher paid her first visit to Beijing knowing that China had the upper hand, but hopeful that Beijing would honor the original treaties ceding Hong Kong to Britain. She had no love of China. Uh, unlike most of the people who'd been feasted and wined and dined up in Peking, she, she didn't love the, the, the China. She made no secret of that. So it wasn't her favorite place. And she was very worried about uh, allowing uh, millions of people under British tutelage under British control to pass under Chinese control. China's paramount leader greeted her in the Great Hall of the People. It was an interesting encounter because both the leaders were a bit uncertain, a bit uneasy with the other. Mrs. Thatcher, despite herself, was overawed by this figure sitting there, um, tough, uh, 
are smoking, making occasional dismissive gestures, a figure of almost unlimited authority and someone from a, a totally alien political environment. I can only put it this way. He's a very concentrated man. He's small, not very tall, um, uh, quite an impressive bone structure and strong face. But the volume of personality, compared to the physical volume, makes the personality even more obvious and very much in charge. Oh, very much. When they got down to business, they had what diplomats call a frank exchange of views. When I was talking to him and said we had done so well for the people of Hong Kong and therefore China, that um, could we keep the, the uh, sovereignty of Hong Kong Island and the administration. And he said, look, I could walk in and take the whole lot this afternoon. And I said, yes, you could. And there's nothing I could do to stop you. But the eyes of the world would now know what China was like. Everything would leave Hong Kong. You would have taken prosperity and you would have suddenly lost a lot. Was she good at putting herself inside his mind, the better to deal with it? I wouldn't say that was one of her outstanding attributes. But toughness was. To the dismay of the diplomats, she did not shrink from challenging Beijing in public. I think if you say that you don't like a treaty, then if ever you're to have certainty that any other treaty you make will have the confidence of the other side. You can't just abrogate one. After all, if you abrogate one, why should anyone believe you that you're serious about another? Our responsibility is to those five million people who've put their faith in us, who've lived under British administration for a long time and who've flourished under British administration. But she left without making progress and after what the Chinese interpreted as a symbolic, if unintentional, gesture. However, despite her setback in Beijing, Thatcher still hoped that Hong Kong might remain British. I was negotiating with Chinese communists, so it was going to be very tough. And yes, they held a lot of cards, but I held an ace, our performance in the governance of Chinese people in Hong Kong. British officialdom harboured no such illusion. The diplomats were certain that China would insist on the return of Hong Kong, and the Britain's only option was to get out on the best terms available. We are dealing with a very proud people who wish to recover uh, national territory, which had been lost to their humiliating circumstances as they saw it and they had no doubt which came first. It was recovering the territory. Naturally, they would like to recover it in prosperous circumstances and to get economic benefits as well. Like everyone, they would like to have their cake and eat it. But they made it very plain that if it came to the crunch, they were prepared to recover the place as a wasteland if need be. In July 1983, the new foreign secretary was dispatched to Beijing to make the opening moves. My biggest aspiration aspirational desires to live up to the year 1997. China was committed, for a whole range of historic reasons, to recovering its sovereignty. And there was no stopping that, whatever we tried to do. We couldn't stop it by force or by appeal to world opinion or anything of that sort. And then on cue, and as if to prove the point, China rattled the sabres. There was a major financial crisis that autumn. The Hong Kong dollar fell through the floor and the Chinese refused any help in propping it up. And indeed, the Bank of China was speculating against us in the currency. In a situation like that, one where the Chinese had overwhelming superiority in terms of influence, power, cards, we had to negotiate for the best we could get. If there was to be a retreat, it had to be an orderly retreat from one carefully defended point to another. 
That retreat went from losing sovereignty to losing administration to China's bottom line. After two years of negotiation, the Joint Declaration of 1984. Thatcher was never enthusiastic. And she came slowly and reluctantly along the path that, in fact, we followed that the Joint Declaration was the best we could do in very difficult circumstances. It would be the best protection we could give uh, Hong Kong. I would have liked Hong Kong Island to be sovereign and for them to have their independence and to be a small member of the United Nations, but China wouldn't have that. In Hong Kong, and more widely, the joint declaration was regarded as a triumph of diplomacy, though there were some who charged Britain with appeasement. To march out, to kick over the table and say, we are going home, these are intolerable demands you're putting on us, might have caused the adrenaline to flow for a minute or two and given momentary satisfaction, particularly perhaps in the British press. But in serious terms, it would have been childish, irresponsible, self-indulgent. We couldn't contemplate it. So your response to those who said that you led a humiliating retreat, the kowtower in chief, would be what? They know nothing about it. The principle underlying the joint declaration was the phrase, one country, two systems. Hong Kong would retain its existing freedoms and would be allowed to hold elections. There was much debate and dispute about what form those elections should take, what kind of democracy and how fast. Then came the killings in Tiananmen Square. In Hong Kong, that horror fueled a hunger. Democracy became a beacon around which to rally for salvation. Elections a vital necessity. A protection, however slight, against the corrupt and vicious regime across the border on the mainland. The man who inherited that demand was never in any doubt about its passion. The alternative to an argument with China wasn't a quiet life. The alternative to an argument with China was four or five years of argument with pro-democracy politicians um, in uh, Hong Kong and with pretty one and everyone, everyone one respects here and outside. Um, you know, I could have had um, hunger strikes and people chained to railings and people resigning from the Legislative Council and by-elections and political turmoil um, of that sort without any great difficulty at all if I'd simply gone along with whatever China had wanted. That very recent past was Patton's poisoned chalice. Hong Kong was divided and uncertain. Some were saying no surrender, others saying back off. China, as ever, intransigent. And the rest of the world wondering, would the British leave their last significant colony in honour or in shame? Despite some British officials in London and Beijing who were only too happy to accommodate China, Patton stood firm. And in February 1994, he published this white paper, which charts the tortuous path towards the breakdown with China. And at the same time, he put his original reform package into the Legislative Council. The United Democrats digested the white paper and examined Patton's proposals. Delighted that they were in their original form, they were irritated by the governor's failure to bang the drum for them. They still feared a sellout and berated Patton accordingly. But this is a very devious and dishonorable and dishonest way of going about it. I have never heard a government which says to its parliament, look, this is the bill we are going to present to you because we believe it is good. But please, if you don't like it, amend it down to whatever you like and now accept it. We've said at every stage, in terms, that we would argue vigorously and work um, very hard to get our proposals through. 
Um, but um, I'm not saying that we won't find any amendment acceptable. Um, that uh, the refusal to rule out any amendment at all um, produces yet again charges of conspiracy. But I went through the eight, nine, ten previous occasions on which Martin and his friends had said we were about to rat on them and pointed out patiently that it was actually 18 months on and still no rat. So maybe they should just be a bit more patient. What do you expect now from the Chinese? Or don't you know? I now have um, sufficient confidence in my knowledge of China and the Chinese to say that we haven't got the faintest idea. At Government House, they awaited the arrival of a VIP. Am I right in thinking that I don't stand when President Robinson toasts the Queen? Because I am the Queen of Hong Kong. Exactly. So I remain you seated. Yes, you, rep you are the Queen, you represent the Queen. So, so when the... Did you get my note about... She's President Robinson, She's President she doesn't Robinson. have a Gaelic name. And she will tell Important the matters of protocol, which the governor found it difficult to take entirely seriously. Just, just like that, but not, not the president of the Republic of China. No, 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 no. You're not sitting there. Go You're there. You're up here. There was, however, the question of where a governor should place himself. Shouldn't we be in the middle? Well, we've always had a governor here, where the place to be, top of the room. Would you prefer to be there? Yeah, I think. I think. I mean, it's we dark. can. I think that is the middle of the room. Okay. We can move it. We can move it. Yeah. We could do it with these, couldn't we? Let's see. I've got no doubt at all. I've got no doubt at all when you stand here. This is this is yeah, the middle of the room. Right. Well, it's a good thing you came in, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, anyway, I sit down for the Queen. You sit down for the Queen. Yeah. Muttering. And we all toast you. As it were. As it were. Yes. It's not, not for you, I am the Queen of Hong Kong. Very well. The old Queen. Very well, sir. Ma'am, truly. Oh, sorry, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 18 months after their fateful meeting in Beijing, Liu Ping arrived in Hong Kong, but pointedly refused an invitation to meet the triple violator, the democracy mad governor. China's allies were embarrassed by his snub. The prevailing theory in Beijing now, of course, is the conspiracy theory. Uh, Everybody is saying we must prepare for the worst. Right now that well, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Patton doesn't have to put up a pretense of uh, uh, cooperating with China, but well, he can do anything he like. Liu Ping joined a gathering of the faithful, that unholy alliance of communist sympathizers and tycoons with whom the Chinese liked doing business. I believe the Chinese government is trying to make a point. They are basically saying that, OK, Mr. Patton, you are pushing ahead with your own proposals. That is not something that we can agree to, so we're not going to deal with you. Today I'm going to play a concerto <laughs> with the theme on one country and two systems. Even now, the I governor allowed himself to believe that common sense might in the end prevail. I think that um, there is a very good chance, um, though I don't intend saying it very much in public because it just pushes them into saying, um, Yao Bu, you're wrong. I think there is a very good chance of the electoral arrangements we put in place this year um, surviving through 97. No, no way. That's a myth. That's, that's Chris Patton's line. It will never have a future. OK, soon you will know in a few months that the Chinese is going to announce the formation of the legislature in 1997. In the meantime, the Chinese appointed a group of Hong Kong and mainland loyalists to what they called a preparatory working committee. Their task, to do Beijing's bidding in the absence of a dialogue with the governor. 
as far as the relationship between uh, China and Britain, I think it will be hitting uh, the bottom. Uh, China will have their own package, and they're going to strengthen the preparatory working committee. So you are looking at two governments at work, and the British government will be undermined, uh, whether they like it or not. In Hong Kong, the PWC, as it was called, was the object of some scorn. If you look at most of the PWC members, they all have a very strong track record in Hong Kong. And if you say that these people have no credibility in the community, I don't think too many people would agree with that view. It doesn't have um, very much credibility at the moment. I think it's principally um, a propaganda instrument. I think the only people who could give it credibility um, aren't the Chinese, but us. And you don't intend to do that? Certainly not. Patton's own credibility was also in question. Although he still enjoyed much popular support, he now had to rally the politicians to his cause. On June the 29th, 1994, almost two years after he first arrived here, the Legislative Council finally met to decide the fate of Patton's proposals for more democracy in Hong Kong. If he won, it would be a huge personal triumph. If he lost, he'd be humiliated and very probably finished as well. At the start of what was to be a very long day, he had absolutely no idea which way the vote would go. If we get what if we get an abstention and a vote against, then it's 25, 29, yeah, I, so we're I, above the margin of three votes. It's it's so it's it's crucial that deal. It's critical for the three votes. I mean, if we get, we get above the three votes. They needed to win by three votes to offset the charge that Patton could only get his way in LegCo with the support of three of the governor's civil servants on the council who had no choice but to support their boss. Those are definite, those are definite, those are definite. definite. Emily Lau, definite. definite. Christine Mayo, I don't know. That's Frederick Fung should be, should be okay. So they are all definite, aren't yeah. they? Is that up to, up to? Three, six, 16, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, So we've got 28 definite. Yeah. We've got a problem. Yesterday was a bad day. We, we began it with a pretty clear indication that we were going to lose because the China votes had decided to vote and that would make it very close. And um, four or five people in the middle, people we thought we could rely upon, went, moved away from us. So that made, made life very difficult. Um, the position is that down in the hothouse of LegCo, these four or five votes are dodging around quite a bit. People changing their minds, people coming under pressure. Um, at the moment, we don't know which way it's going to go. It's very, very close. Just, just repeat, Vincent phoned you up and said that he and Simon and Martin were all going to abstain. Yeah, and he was also told Nick that's the same. He doesn't break his word. Patton was on edge. Martin Lee, now an ally, was supposed to stitch up a deal on the governor's behalf with a wavering voter, but something had gone wrong. I mean, Martin is... It really is like trying to deal with the entire society of Jesus. <laughs> it's a little fucking day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I think the thing to say is that um, um, I'm not saying anything well, until the debate's over and all the votes have been taken. Okay, I'll head them off. Well, it's professional tennis after this. I saw um, half a dozen people, and I saw some the day before, and I saw some last Friday. I've really started um, Clintonizing um, since the end of last week. I don't much like it. I'm not one of nature's whips. But um, there it is. It had to be done. I don't want to go through this again. If they, if they all vote in favour, if, yeah, yeah, right. if that fails, yeah, you're right. they're up to yeah, 29, yeah. so we lose. The threat was an anti-pattern amendment moved by Alan Lee. This deal decides the fate. I've been taking sleeping pills the last few nights. Patton faced the real prospect of defeat. 
Um, yes, of course you think about that, but um, it will be a mess. And um, I'll have to clear it up. Yeah, that's extremely I mean, important for the swing. They were then on 27, 27. Mm, mm, mm. That assumes Pang Chun Hoi does defend. Mm, mm. Right, then, then it's the president's casting vote. Yeah. So if Martin Lee rejects this deal... Yeah, that's awful. We fall. We fall. I mean, what it shows is that when you talk to Martin Lee, um, it really is absolutely fundamental. It's not just optional extra. Yeah. But I, th I thought they'd said they were going to abstain. Yeah, but they're now... They're now swinging back. Vincent had called. I mean, Vincent has been speaking to me, saying that Eric Lee is lobbying incredibly hard. You know, well, we're, we're going to get a lot of. We're going to get get it all day. But it shows the importance. Of, if we stitch up that deal, we're all right, even if it goes wrong. Right. Okay. Hand over the hand. It will be so annoying if Martin cocks up this deal, you know, actually arguing about whether somebody should vote against the amendment or abstain. I mean, it's so... <laughs> it's Edward Llewellyn here. Um, I'm looking for either CM Learn or um, Vivian Sum. And it is my conclusion that the scales should be tipped by people whose home has been and will be Hong Kong for generations to come. Hence it is my decision to abstain on the major or significant votes and not to take sides. You got my brief? Yeah. Yeah, will you? All right. Well, if we lost it because of Emily and Martin, um, that would be a remarkable outcome. Yeah, but also if, um, if Simon went back on what he said. Oh, yes, yes. It is. Oh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll call yeah. you. In the afternoon, Patton had official duties, but his mind was elsewhere. What will irritate me most is if we lose the um, allegations that it was all part of a conspiracy that we meant to lose all along, or that we didn't try. We didn't try. We didn't try hard enough. <laughs> but we're not going to lose. Mr. Patton, how would you see today's debate in Lashko? I know they are now the ongoing debate. Uh, I think the issue is being resolved in the right way. It's being resolved by the representatives of the people of Hong Kong in the open. It's not being decided uh, in secret behind closed doors. And I think that's a very important step forward for Hong Kong. So as the Chief Secretary just pointed out, today's debate is a monumental issue. But, sir, the intense last-minute lobbying, the 17, 18 months... If Patton's team was lobbying hard, the Chinese government was interfering directly in Hong Kong's internal affairs. Lu Ping rang Pang Zhang Hoi at Lechko and tell Pang Zhang Hoi, all I ask of you is to leave the chamber when they put it to vote. Disappear in the toilet or anywhere. Just don't vote. And Pang Chen Hai said, I would not do that. Bloody hell. So he's tried with both Hoi Yin Fat and Pang Chen yeah, they, they, they saw this where, where the swings are. How are you? Do you not think you should? Yeah, the governor should call these two. Just to... yeah. And Pang Chen Hai was so worried he hit somewhere in the chamber. He refused to take any more calls. So he's still all right? He's still all right. Well, that's what's amazing, but I mean, no, I think it's very much you shouldn't do. Sending to that, you know, I mean, we don't need to send to that kind of business. But CM still thinks that Hai Yin Fat and Bang Chun Hai are all right. Grab up. That's what CM say. But on this, I mean, even on this analysis, if we lose him, still. Well, Leo, I think what is called for, among other things, is prayer. So, I want to be the Hong Kong Duck. 由於一次政改嘅選舉搞到中英中港嘅咁嘅關係，而提議一個完全冇前途嘅政改方案，我並唔贊同
After nine hours of debate, the outcome is still in doubt. But we think at the moment that they are hanging in there. Yeah. Certainly there's a little political concept in this place, isn't it? As we have discovered during the course of the day. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to do you guys any good by sitting around like a... You are, you're a moral beast. Jaded lemon. <laughs> Just keep us happy. Then there was another call from Beijing, not from the Chinese, but this time from the chairman of the Hong Kong Bank, Sir William Purvis, urging his man in Legco to vote against Patton. Willie Purvis actually well, this is, this phoned up this is what Vincent the Chang. That phoned up apparently from uh, from Peking. From Peking. Where Liu Ping is, so Liu Ping is also calling up. Well, it's good when people act according to absolutely in character. <laughs> Willie Purvis is true to the last. It's a member of your executive council, I believe. They won't have to make the phone calls from Peking to get people to vote the right way after 1997. <laughs> Just a local, local call. Just a local call, which are free, actually. <laughs> save, save on the telephone bill. <laughs> 而很多人都說, 彭定康, 可能在97年走, 或者早點走, these circumstances, you know, because whatever you s say, either he thinks the votes are there or he thinks they de they're not there, and, you know, I can't reassure him that they're there if they're not. I think I've got to support him and not panic, you know. I wouldn't be much good to him if I was <laughs> screaming. I mean, she's gone down un unbeknown to the... Yeah. There was another wavering vote to be corralled. CM's on the other line. CM, it was just Mike on the other line saying that Margaret Ng is is apparently gone down under her own steam. Margaret Ng was on her way to put pressure on the lawyer's representative in Legco, Simon Ip. If he could be turned round, Patton was in with a chance. For the first time, the governor scented success. We sure? We sure? Cut that out too. <laughs> so, can we go for on Marvin now? Well, just let's hope that vote comes before Simon Ip changes his mind again. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, if we've got Simon Ip, um, we've got one vote margin. It was not the margin they wanted, but it would kill the Liberal Amendment. Members, please proceed to vote. Are there any queries? If not, the results will now be displayed. The result is 28 for the eyes, 29 for the nose. Yes! Those that the nose have... Oh, yes! Just said close! Yes! Yes! Oh, yes. That's a sign. What? That's a sign. 29, 28. We're over the, the first hurdle. We're now going to the election committee level. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're through the first big hurdle. So we're, yeah, it's just on the news. It just came in on the news. Yeah. Yeah. Commentator, but it is very exciting at the moment. The legislators have just broken for dinner after that a very exciting challenge from the Liberal Party was defeated by a very narrow margin of 29 votes to 28. One vote, huh? He didn't win, I could tell you this. He bulldozed through a twisting arm. One member, the same member called me who, said, who told me one thing. He says the independent members are on the wheelchair. Our limbs has been taken off. <laughs> can, we, can you 
Of it may be a little sure. premature, yeah, but it is worth a glass of champagne. We well, still have half of it. It's really bad for Hong Kong. He is bringing the Westminster politics into Hong Kong. And he handles the Chinese like they are the opposition party. He handles us as the opposition party. And I think whatever opposing to him, he will handle it that way. Mr. Hong Kong. Well done, everybody. Ah. Chief Secretary is appointed. Attorney General, Financial Secretary. Alan Lee. Appointed. Selena Chow. Appointed. Patton um, totted up the Patton, votes. Martin Lee not. <laughs> David, David Lee, Lee, no. no. no nice you kiss. kiss. Really? Did somebody elect him? Yeah, <laughs> industrial, one of the industrial <laughs> Hong Kong His hope that the votes in his support from the elected members to LegCo would outweigh the votes against him from those appointed to LegCo. <laughs> Peggy Lam. Appointed. Mary, Miriam Lau. Appointed. Lau Wa Sum. Appointed. <laughs> C. H. Leung. Elected. Peter Wong. Elected. Peter Wong is elected. Accountancy. Bloody hell. Twenty-three to fifteen. Mm -hmm. of elected members. If, um, That's the answer we've got to keep on using yeah. if people talk about the official vote. The Legislative Council Electoral Provisions Amendment Bill has passed through committee with amendments. I move that the bill be read the third time and do pass. Would members please proceed to vote? After a few minor amendments, the Patton Bill, in its original blueprint, went through with a resounding majority. The result is 32 for the ayes, 24 for the noes. Uh, yeah, yeah. His package will have no chance, absolutely no chance. He's trying, still trying to fool this LegCo and the uh, 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 Hong Kong people says, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with this package. It's according to the basic law, etc., and it will be going through 1997. Now, for Christ's sake, we're, we're, we're not morons. I mean, okay, we're not kindergarten kids. A very quick hello to Laura. Good night. Okay. Chris? Okay, I'm coming. Quick, quick, quick. Is that Laura? <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick, quick. Oh, right, it... here he comes. Love you, darling. Mm. Right, okay, bye. Hi. She's in a phone box. <laughs> oh, I love you. We, we've just won. There was to be a terrible battle, but on the morning after the night before, the governor could for once save a victory. There's a wonderful story of Willie Whiteclaw um, when something went right, um, saying, um, um, everybody tells me I mustn't crow. Um, I'm certainly not going to crow. I'm certainly not going to let anybody see me crowing. But inside, he said, I'm crowing like mad. <laughs> um, but to be serious, it, it, was, it was a terrific um, day. Um, it was the end of two years. Um, bumps, ups and downs, horrors, holes in the road. Um, and we've got it all through, and we've kept things together. Think what it would have been like if we'd lost. It would have been a bloody mess. It would, have, I'm sure, have led to calls for my departure as soon as possible.